Okay, if everyone's ready to go, we'll dive right into our Water Committee meeting uh, and we'll start by recognizing that we're on the unceded territories of the Comox First Nation and we'll move right into our delegations. So I'd like to welcome Megan Kersons, the Community Forest Society. Hello. Hi. Hello, strangers. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Um, you know me with different hats on at different times, so I'll say today my name is Megan. I'm the executive director of the Cumberland Community Forest Society. We're a charitable nonprofit that's been operating since the year 2000. We have a 13 member board of directors from across the Comox Valley, and uh, pleased to be here today. Um, much like David has acknowledged, um, we're very viscerally aware that we do our work in land conservation and water protection within the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. So I'm here to talk to you about the project that we're engaged in as a community. Um, and as you know from your uh, agenda to ask for your support. Um, this is the project as, as we describe it as an organization in terms of the land base that it represents. Um, do I have a laser? I do. Um, the yellow is a large tract of land that was purchased by the society in uh, 2005. Uh, the Coal Creek Historic Park is the former Chinatown and Japanese town um, that was um, acquired by the village uh, from Weldwood uh, about 15, 20 years ago. And this orange long stretch here is Project Perseverance, which is the project that I'm uh, wanting to talk to you about today. This is uh, the same landscape from a watershed perspective. This little blue uh, area here is the Perseverance Creek watershed, and this cream area is the Cumberland Creek watershed, which intersects um, with the Perseverance watershed. Um, uh, and this, of course, is a map of the subwatersheds of the Comox Lake watershed. What's interesting in this map is this is a land ownership map of the same um, base of land, so you'll see the two different shades of light green and green are all the forestry-owned lands within the watershed. The purple are uh, water sh the uh, Perseverance and Cumber Cumberland Creek watershed lands that were protected by the village of Cumberland back in the 1960s. And this line here is the line that we're talking about now, which is from Allen Lake all the way to Comox Lake Road, um, the largest sort of creek stretch of the um, Perseverance Creek watershed. And this is what it looks like um, in our hearts <laughs> in Cumberland. It's this beautiful place. If you've had a chance to uh, walk in the upper reaches of it, this is the, the potholes. And people come from all over the valley, uh, ride their bikes up the Davis Bay Main, pass this into timber westlands, and, uh, and enjoy themselves uh, in the Perseverance watershed. However, this uh, system has some challenges. Um, it's right in the heart of 150 years of timber harvesting. It's privately held. It's managed under the Private Managed Forest Lands Act, um, which has some very um, minimum requirements related to riparian setbacks and habitat restoration. There are canyons and steep forest slopes above the creek. There's a lot of inherited liability in this system. Uh, poorly designed installed culverts, spillways, damage over the years. We're faced increased, ex uh, increased extreme weather events due to climate change causing flashing and uh, the all famous turbidity. The geology is challenging in this area because it's actually a sort of a bank of clay that separates the sort of gravelly landscape that's uh, down at the sort of the glacial marine and the larger rocks that you'll find further up the lake. It's this lovely band of, of clay perhaps related to the band of coal you'll find there too. There's erosion throughout the system, sediment and gravel accumulation in the creek causing habitat degradation. It's 150 years of forestry without a watershed management lens, purely in a resource extraction and, and economic uh, development lens until more recently, but that legacy very much remains. And of course, this is a famous, the famous photo. This is we've 2000 in December 2015. Um, and the sediment dump from Perseverance Creek into Comox Lake. But there's a lot of hope around this system right now, and uh, it's really driven by a desire to do better and to do good work in the context of larger watershed protection within the Comox Valley. We have a very unique opportunity that aligns with the Watershed Protection Plan, climate adaption, uh, data on hand, regional conservation priorities. I'm just going to quickly walk through these opportunities so I can share them with you in the context of our ask. 
Um, the project that we're engaged in responds to key recommendations within the WPP. One is the securing of lands should they become available for uh, water supply protection, which was one of the things that motivated the Cool Beach acquisition when that became uh, available from the uh, uh, Comox Lake Land Corporation. Uh, the protection of riparian areas has been identified as providing ecosystem services uh, for the Comox Lake watershed and improving inputs to water treatment infrastructure that will be coming into play. From a climate adaption project, this is, again, looking through the climate lens, which is the primary recommendation of the WPP. This supports uh, biodiversity, which regulates ecosystems. It helps to mitigate uh, when you don't uh, deforest uh, riparian areas and forest lands. Uh, mitigate the effects of winter weather, help to retain water through drought conditions, provide eco-asset protection in the context of the watershed, and, and in fact reduce carbon emissions as well. The project that we're engaged in in the watershed right now is also a little bit you know, ahead of the pack in terms of the data that we have on hand, and we're feel really fortunate about that. Uh, it's a combination of CVRD work, uh, Village of Cumberland, and, um, and Cumberland Community Forest Society, and Comox Valley Land Trust efforts. Um, and we have more comprehensive data around this system than any other system within the watershed because, again, all of those are falling within um, uh, a more uh, private managed lens. Um, so you can ask questions after if you like about when any of those are, but we do have recent proper functioning conditions that's identified the state of the creek from Allen Lake uh, to the lake as um, functional but declining. Uh, we have fish habitat assessment, species at risk, sensitive ecosystems inventory. We have up-to-date land surveys, land appraisal, timber valuations, and forest engineering reviews. The project lines up with conservation priorities. Regionally, um, the area represents what's known as a dry maritime coastal hemlock climate, which um, we are seeing, as everyone is aware, sort of a band of drier um, biogeoclimatic sort of zone moving its way up the island, um, looking more Mediterranean. It's that more arbutus um, forest. It's a, a very different forest that we're going to see kind of moving into the future in this part of the world. And actually, the type of forest that we have here right now and its ability to regenerate as climate changes has placed it at risk. It's one of the top three regional conservation priorities for your, the regional Comox Valley Land Trust. It's a biodiversity corridor. It aligns with uh, the federal government's Target One Challenge, which is 17% of land protection uh, for biodiversity. It's eligible for funding under the Natural Heritage Conservation Program, which applies to people trying to secure private lands as opposed to protection of crown lands, which is um, what's happening more in the north. And, um, and it definitely um, uh, flows into um, what we hope will be future regulations related to the Water Sustainability Act. If you're not familiar with this project, we have really strong support from across the valley. Our organization's 19 years old. Um, we've uh, acquired over $2 million worth of private forest held lands to date with strong regional support, lots of wellness, we, uh, awareness. Uh, we have a willing seller, which is not the case in all the privately held forest lands within our region, but with Comox Timber it is. And, um, and we have excellent partnerships with local uh, environmental nonprofits as well as the Courtney and District Fish and Game Protective Association. There's conservation and restoration um, opportunities and partners in play. The lands we've acquired to date are protected through a Section 219 covenant, which is a covenant that's um, uh, part of the Land Act, which uh, determines the use of the land in perpetuity and is signed on or is held by the Comox Valley Land Trust. There's immense opportunity right now given the partnerships for restoration planning processes. There's alignment with other land protection efforts um, and well-established funding relationships. This one's kind of cool because it sort of looks at the accumulative impact of land protection that's happening, and the regional district has already been very much a part of this. Um, there's 471, uh, sorry, acres, there's a typo there, uh, protected by um, the uh, parklands currently adjacent to Perseverance Creek. Um, and uh, future protection of lands to the north, which is lower perseverance and a parcel we call Middle Earth, um, plus the CVRD's um, purchased lands at Comox Lake will eventually bring a corridor together from Comox Lake all the way up to the top of the Perseverance watershed of 1,300 acres. Oh, there we go. Um, and for this project, we are here today because we have 50% of the funds in place and we're moving into uh, the matching discussions with other levels of government and funding agencies. We have very strong and active fund development going on. That's not stopping. 
we're working actively with our MP and with the Canada Nature Heritage Fund um, uh, for funding opportunities rolling out toward the end of the year. And we're proposing a project that also does not leave the CVRD with management obligations, which is different from perhaps the Cole Beach uh, project um, because of the covenant application, um, which is informed uh, by all the partners, but then directs the management of those lands. How many more slides have you got? Two. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> uh, collaboration and integrated watershed protection. Um, we, you know, there's a photo of Cole Beach, which has been an incredible effort by the CVRD recently to secure a big chunk of watershed edged lands. Um, and we see this project as a building block towards integrated watershed protection. Um, the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative underway currently is identified, identified Perseverance Creek as a focus of uh, opportunity for many of the reasons we've articulated already, one being the, the data that exists, the, the willing seller, and the work that's been done to date around identifying what needs to be done with that system. Uh, it lines with the WPP. There's a really wonderful uh, swelling of regional collaboration that we're seeing related to land protection, increased awareness about the watershed, climate urgency, and, uh, and an overarching understanding about how the community is connected by water, regardless of which pipe it comes out of. Um, so the lake is holding a fairly special place in the heart of a, a lot of people right now in both uh, the imagination and hopes of the community, not just in Cumberland, but across the Comox Valley as a symbol of a place where we can perhaps choose to get it right in the context of climate adaption and take the protective steps we need to ensure safe drinking water for the valley and ecosystem protection for you know, the well-being of, uh, well, life in all its forms. Um, but yeah, that's a picture of Comox Lake and two people doing what's a completely chilled out and mellow activity on Comox Lake, um, the kind we like to see. Um, and uh, that's the background that I wanted to give you on the project. You have a letter in your um, agenda that is specific regarding our request. And if you have any questions, I'm available. Yeah, thanks very much. We definitely have um, some questions. Uh, Director Hamir. Great. Thanks, and thanks, Megan, for your presentation. Those are some fantastic photos. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe go into a little bit more detail about um, you mentioned um, some risks within Perseverance Creek with the current landowner. Yeah. Would you be able to like extrapolate a little bit more? Absolutely. So we've done a full site walk with Comox Timber um, last fall so that when we were doing our process, our planning process, we wanted to have a really good sense so we could line up when we received the timber valuation and the forest engineer's reports. Um, you know, what it is they cut and don't cut. Um, so we walked the ground with um, Ian Delisle, who's a longtime forester with Comox Timber, sat at the WPP table for years, I believe. Um, and two places, well, three places that were very significant. Um, you know, one is the, the top banks on either side of the Perseverance Canyon. Riparian areas are, it's the definition of them within the Private Forest Managed Lands Act leaves some things to be interpreted. So when you start to look at some of the top bank cutting um, along Perseverance Creek, and you definitely see it lower below Comox Lake Road. Uh, it's pretty close to the edge. Mm -hmm. But the one that really struck us was the slope above what's called China Creek. And it's where Perseverance Creek sort of fans out into this riparian and wetland area. And there's this very steep slope. And we walked through there with, there were two foresters and a conservationist with us. And they said, the reason why you love this forest is the same reason we love it. That is a valuable bank of trees. And so we asked them a lot of questions about mm -hmm. how that's extracted and to what extent they would pull it back and where the roads would be. And it's essentially a, a slope that sits a, above Perseverance Creek uh, mm -hmm. full of 120-year-old trees. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing we could expect then quite a lot more siltation coming out of something like that? I'm not, yeah, I mean, you can extrapolate that given other things that we've seen. Yeah. It's definitely not what I'm aware of within conservation practices as good riparian protection. And that's because, um, as you mentioned, some of the practices on that privately managed act, the Forest Act, don't require higher protection levels? Yeah, you can or? have as little as 10 meter setbacks depending on the class of the stream. So as the streams are flowing into other streams, you have like A, A, B, C, D, and E. And a lot of people will talk about 30 meter riparian setbacks, but those will often be talked about in the context of actually crown land or forest license that people have, whereas the 10 meter is where the minimum sits under the Private Forest Managed Lands Act. Right. Thank and you. compliance is voluntary. Yeah. Thanks. If I could just build on that a bit. Um, 
What, what other opportunities would there be uh, considering the clay sediment issue that we've had to, to mitigate? That's, is there any opportunities that you can identify us for us right now? Yeah, we, we have could... several points of erosion. There's, there's no question that there are multiple inherited liabilities. There's legacy liability on that system all the way from the top of the Perseverance watershed right down to Comox Lake. Some of those erosion areas are within the purchase areas, some are not. We did a, a, a proper functioning condition um, a research project with Ecofish that identified, which I put into the report, which identified some preliminary steps that could be taken for bank stabilization and culvert replacement, but we can't be pursuing funding to do any of those projects without actually moving the land out of the private land base into the ownership, into our ownership. So um, some of the key ones are culvert replacement, the Squamish, Squamish culverts below Allen Lake um, at a place right around, some people know as short and curly. Um, and the other is a extremely undersized culvert that was put in under Comox Lake Road when that wasn't actually part of the village of Cumberland. Um, that was a Modi and, and Ministry of Highways infrastructure project when that was in the regional district. Um, so we've inherited this um, uh, culvert that's, you know, fire hosing water against the adjacent bank. There's some pretty straightforward, um, you know, qu quicker fixes, even quicker than um, some of the things that need to be done in uh, related to um, uh, the dam above Allen Lake and uh, the restoration of the spillway as well. It's all an integrated mm -hmm. project. And you mentioned that uh, the, the purchase is currently 50% funded. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us who's... Who's funding that 50% so the far? The community has funded that. Yeah, yeah it's $1.3 million in community-based fundraising with the exception of 200000 from uh, the Fish and Wildlife Compensation Program. They fund um, acknowledging damage to um, habitat areas as a result of BC Hydro operations. And because of the lake levels that BC Hydro um, has the influence over, um, we were um, a, a eligible recipient within the Comox Lake watershed for our work. They also funded a, the research project that we did, and they also are funders of uh, restoration work, which is what we hope is our next step in our relationship with them. Um, the rest is uh, uh, this community, some of you in the room. Um, it's, an, it's been an incredible, it's pushing us into $3.3 million worth of land acquisition fundraising in the past 20 years. Um, and But this represents a shift in our approach to a more um, regional conversation around the connection between this to the larger uh, watershed. And you mentioned, uh, oh, we have another question from Director Grieve and all. Well, I was going to ask about um, the 219 Covenant you mentioned, and I'm wondering what that means, like how strong is it? You know, what happens if um, the society decides it dissolve, wants to dissolve and those yeah. sorts of questions? Sure. Um, these are, right now it's held by the Comox Valley Land Trust, which shows no sign of going anywhere. The Cumberland Community Forest Society is actually not a signatory on the, mm. on the covenant, although at this point we've been around as long as some of the other organizations. But um, it's sort of a third party um, holding. So it's filed under the Land Act. Um, feel very confident in the work that the Land Trust is doing and I believe there's other um, covenants being applied to other lands perhaps that the regional district's been involved in. Um, it's, uh, we, have, we have very high confidence in that. That's why we do it instead of just allowing it to be designated as parkland, which can be rezoned in the future. Um, yeah, and Director Grieve, do you want to ask a question? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Well, as you may know or may not know, I was uh, part of the Pearl Lake Select Committee that worked uh, with Cumberland to uh, to get Pearl Lake from uh, I think Hancock Timber that owned the lake and uh, cool. we, we went through a whole process there but there was a there was definitely a reluctance at that time from Cumberland to partner on it, on that project and it was very frustrating because we went through about two years of meetings and did a lot of work in fact. Uh, uh, Grant and Aid from Area C did a lot of the surveying work when we looked at that. And at the end of the day, it was, um, you know, it was snatched up just beneath our noses because we couldn't, we couldn't agree to work with uh, funding agencies like uh, Freshwater Fisheries and Ducks Unlimited and everything else. So it's very reassuring to see, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, uh, the village having well, I know this isn't the village; it, it's you guys. But to, to have maybe a, you know, a broader, more fulsome uh, uh, view of how we can actually acquire these these special mm -hmm. places, because we don't get a second chance. No, we don't. 
this is it. Uh, so, again, you know, I, I, a little bit sour grapes there, but uh, it was too bad. <laughs> Me too. You know. <laughs> it was Maple too Lake. bad. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was there and when, when it when it happened, and there was a lot of people pulling for it. I think uh, oh. Hugh McKenna was uh, there from Comox and you know, yep. a lot of good people. Anyway, um, you talk about uh, Zone 2, 3, 4, uh, Zone 1. Um, are all these properties, do they all exist within the village boundary? Uh, there's a little chunk of uh, one of the zones that falls into, uh, falls C. out of, yeah, which falls out of the village of Cumberland. Because there you see, of yeah. course, surrounds the entire lake. Yeah. And all the watershed. Thank you. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Director Grieve. Director Arbor. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, I would, uh, following on Dr. Grief's comments, I mean, I... This is definitely a great project, and it, it seems to have a regional value. Um, but I, I went on the website before, and and I just, you know, I'm a bit like Director Grieve. Even on the regional basis, I could see us investing some money in this, but I still have questions around. When I go on your website, you said you say that the forest, the community forest, ultimately the lands would be owned by the village of Cumberland. Mm -hmm. But so, um, so is it the case with the current lands that you have? All or? the lands we apply, we um, raise 100% of the funds for the land, negotiate the application of the covenant, and then um, and then hand them to the village of Cumberland for. Um, we're up to this point in time have chose not to be parks managers, right. um, and so that's where those lands have gone up to this time. And there's agreement uh, with the current purchase as well. As much as there's. Um, uh, awareness of the burden that that involves and that's part of the evolution I think right now of, of Cumberland as a community as our relationship with the with the village the change in the region this is an amazing time right now related to collaboration and uh, and I look to like the Couscousum City of Courtney and uh, Project Watershed and KFN relationship as sort of again one of those models is that some of us are good at raising funds and applying for conservation dollars and coming up with restoration plans and some of us hold the cultural knowledge and some of us are land managers. And it's a similar thing that motivates what we're doing there is each to their expertise and capacity. And, and uh, would it become a problem if the CVRD wanted some type of ownership in regards to their contribution? I can't speak to that. I imagine that there would be all kinds of conversation to be had about that contribution. Okay. Well, I'm definitely uh, supportive yeah. of staff in the watershed group to, to keep looking at this and in a timely fashion. Thanks. And Director Wells. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and, yeah, I, I think you, there's definitely probably a... Uh, support from around the table um, on this project. Uh, and, and I know it's not necessarily within the scope of this, but just looking at other things, uh, I know there was a Maple Lake uh, committee for many years that I sat on and mm -hmm. and, uh, and then unfortunately sort of got, got sold. Uh, but I just wondered where, where that um, is, if you have any idea where that is sitting. Because it sounded like it got sold but might be used as a, yeah. I don't know if you want to use pawn, I mean, but. That's going backwards. Now you're going to. I, I know too much. No, um, <laughs> it's different to be negotiating a land acquisition from a timber company than from a development company, and so unfortunately, uh, it, you're in a diff you're in a different situation. I mean, there's disadvantages to purchasing directly from the timber company, and that we have to do land appraisal and timber valuation, but. Maple Lake now sits within the purchase par parcel that is owned by a third party who might be have their eyes on more things than timber. Um, mm. However, uh, I'll be honest that the, the stretch of land along the south flank of the village and out to Comox Lake, which then goes out um, on the other side of the highway and across to the Morrison Headwaters and Maple Lake is all part of an interconnected system that's mm -hmm. related to Comox Lake. Yeah. So I can only hope that in the future Maple Lake will fall into the same thing as Morrison Headwaters and we'll be doing integrated watershed planning and land protection as a valley, as a region, as opposed to within silos. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, the story's not over for me. Maple Lake yeah. is still... Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think that that's kind of what, you know, again, looking at that, that sort of higher... Our, um, elevation uh, view of things and, totally. and some of the options but I guess one of the things that, that just based on your comments here is just being aware that you know um, you know dealing with the the timber company is a bit of a known thing but if it's developers it may be a, a totally different uh, conversation with yes. with different uh, expectations so th thanks for the answer thank you director grant 
Yeah, I, this sounds like a really, really good project, actually, and uh, well done on the fundraising. Thanks, uh, my issue is uh, similar to Daniel's, and, and it's just the ownership piece at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, you know, if we're at the RD going around and buying pieces around the watershed, and all of a sudden we have one piece that's owned by somebody else, that may or may not be problematic in the future. So I think that's a discussion that needs to be had. But beyond that, I think it's, you know, this, this is good. I like it. Thanks, Ken. Director Hillian. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, uh, Megan, for an excellent presentation. And um, might also say that it was a pleasure to uh, walk through the area recently. Uh, I had that opportunity with you, and uh, it really is a special area. Um, I, I don't see anywhere in the report where it speaks about the time frame. Uh, wh what, um, what sort of uh, pressures are there to uh, do this in, in a particular time period? So the pressures that exist that these areas were all within Comox Timbers logging plans, but each time we uh, negotiate on a stay of execution, we've done this each time, uh, Comox Timber doesn't tend to enter into MOUs specifically, um, but they are active and at the table and in the conversation and they know where we're at. We're transparent around where we're at in our fundraising. The time pressures come with land appraisal and timber valuation, so they have a lifespan on them, and then you're at the whims of the market. Um, and so that's the big question mark sometimes regarding both land and timber. So we're sitting on some current valuations right now. Um, if we don't close within a certain amount of time, we'd have to open up those valuations, and um, which isn't a huge expense for the organization, but it opens us up to the whims of the market. So I'd say it's a gamble. Every time you, you know, every time you extend. Right now, we have known variables. We have a no, we understand the seller's interest, and we have known variables. Anytime you have to reappraise and redo the timber crews, then you have unknown variables. Um, I know that our organization hopes to close by end of fiscal 2020. Thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. And Director Grieve. Very, very quickly. I know we're pressed for time. Just to plant a seed. Um, at one time. Uh, the regional district, well, it was a bigger regional district then, had a regional parks function mm -hmm. that everybody paid into. Unfortunately, when we had the larger board, we couldn't agree on what to do, and I think it was actually rescinded, that service. So just a thought, Nanaimo has it, uh, Cowich and Valley has it, they all pay into it, and they're able to buy these big pieces when they come up, mm -hmm. like Couscous, some, the, the Puntlish Triangle, um, um, the, the, the community forest in Cumberland. So just a thought, it, we, there's, a, there's a quick and easy way of, uh, of establishing a service yeah. that, that could do all this and be kind of trans-jurisdictional. Well, what's wonderful is you have a water service that's trans-jurisdictional right now that we're speaking to and, and looking at that from a parks perspective, I know as a Cumberland resident who watches our parking lots full of people from all over the region every single day of the on-season, we're providing a regional parks amenity to the broader region, and people understand that in Cumberland now, uh, just as we are providing a watershed protection opportunity as well with a regional perspective. I think that that way of thinking is the way it's at right now, Edwin, and it's, I think it's very, very positive for all of our communities. Yeah. Well, um, I missed it, so maybe someone can move receipt of the delegation for me. And all those in favor? And um, I might suggest that we ask for a staff report at this time, just um, outlining some of the opportunities and impl implications of partnering right. on the purchase of this property. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thanks very much for, uh, for the presentation. Thank you kindly. Uh, are there any other thoughts or questions? Are you okay with that, CEO? All those in favor? And that looks like it's unanimous. Thanks very much. And we'll move straight into the um, water metering within the Comox Valley. Oh, I'm sorry. No, management report? Second. All in. Oh, it's Director Wells. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I uh, just wanted to, to note the, the one item on there that, uh, from 2017 uh, that talks about uh, a workshop or doing something with uh, um, the irrigation companies within the Comox Valley, which I'm, I'm sure staff are aware. I've been uh, banging that drum for uh, uh, quite a few years now. But uh, um, one, one of the interesting things uh, just uh, uh, that happened while I was uh, at Home Depot looking for some pipe fittings is, is like they were out of many things. And they said, oh, yeah, people are are 
getting the message that uh, they have to put in drip uh, uh, systems and and so they're running out of, of that kind of stuff but I just thought it just reminded me again and then seeing yeah. it on here it's sort of like just making sure that uh, if there are opportunities for us to uh, to work with the, those organizations and and really work on that messaging I, I think um, uh, the bit of messaging that we're doing already has has had that that effect but just making sure that that we keep pushing it uh, um, because that uh, will play into the next thing on the agenda. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for pointing that, that out. And I wonder um, if our stage four might have been sort of that engagement that you had imagined uh, by fire, I suppose. Um, Director Hamir, you have right. some thoughts on that? Yeah, um, and I, I don't know if this is the, the, the right place to ask it, but um, seeing as we're just talking about irrigation, um, if I can ask staff, uh, the province just declared a stage three for Vancouver Island, and I'm just wondering if that does trigger anything within the regional district when the province declares a, a drought level? Um, um, Chair, I'll ask uh, Chris LaRose to come forward and uh, right. provide a response to that. Sure, through the CEO and through the chair. Um, so the uh, we had a lot of questions about this last year when I think we went through, through to stage four drought uh, levels in the middle of the summer. Uh, so we, there is not a direct connection between the levels of drought and, and our watering restrictions, and that, that is because we... Uh, we, we, we feed off of uh, the, the Bisa Hydro Reservoir, so we're very, very fortunate in that regard compared to a lot of the other watersheds on the east coast of Vancouver Island that don't have storage and who are very much at the whim of the, uh, of the weather patterns. So, um, so the, uh, the system we have set up now and that we will be formalizing um, shortly um, with BC Hydro is um, specific thresholds. So as BC Hydro um, revised their projections for the summer, um, if they're feeling like they can't make it, they won't be able to make it through to the end of the summer at the minimum fish flows required by the water use plan, then they will drop their flows. And we've seen that uh, um, for most of the last several years. Um, so if they drop, the, the, the arrangement we're setting up is if they drop below the 15.4 meter cube per second, then we automatically go to a stage two. Um, and then if they go far, even farther than that, down to 11.6 or so, uh, then we will they will go to a stage three. So we are very much tied to um, BZ Hydro's projections for flow down the river. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Are there any more questions on the management report? Seeing none, all those in favor? And I imagine none opposed. That's unanimous. And so we will move into the water meter in, within Comox Valley. All in favor? And there is a requested action. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Arbor. Did you want to speak to it? Yeah, sure, I will. So uh, why not? As somebody new um, on this board, I guess I've, I've uh, participated in the committee. But I think last meeting I mentioned when, when will we have space to talk about water meters, which seemed to be a very effective conservation measure. and then. I've talked to multiple people since around some of the history, but I think it. Uh, I'm curious because in the in the um, in the severely rural areas, uh, we have a policy. I think all of our water systems are on water meters. I understand Comox is halfway there or something like that, and and Courtney is not quite there. So, I'm just wondering as we're making a major investment into our water treatment plant and into the long term, when we know that one of the key conservation measures is to introduce water meters around the world. Uh, I'm just, I was just wondering if I could have some more background in history and whether it's worth a second look to have uh, water meters across the Comox Valley. Um. Yeah, and it's an interesting, uh, interesting angle. I mean, from, from Courtney's perspective, I did ask our, um, our director of uh, public works, um, Trevor Krishner, to, to highlight what, what's going on in Courtney, and uh, he informed me that we're going to be seeing a report in the next... I think before the end of summer. So, uh, Courtney's, you know, we're going to be looking at that those opportunities. Um, I'm not sure how interested uh, the water committee is on a whole of the whole system and everyone, but um, I guess that's what we're talking about right now. Director Grant. Yeah. So uh, I think this is probably something that the community should deal with. I know we're we're about 50% on meters now uh, in Comox, and we're applying for funding to get. The other 50%. The big issue of this when it came up the first time was mostly cost. It was going to be $10 million for Comox to retrofit the houses to 
put water meters in and that was the killer. Uh, Cumberland went out and got grant funding, which was great, but no one else could get it. Mm -hmm. So that's why from our community, we then started instituting a little pilot project and we have the most convoluted system of charging for water you could ever imagine. And it's, it's ridiculous and I'd love to get that part of it straightened away, but it was really a funding issue more than anything. Uh, and a behavior change too, but um, you know, I think that if you were to go and build a community from scratch, you would of course put water meters in, but the uh, retrofit was super expensive and the lifespan was about eight to 12 years. So then you'd have to go back and re, you know, and th that, that was part of the decision in our community at mm -hmm. that time. Yeah, and I'm fairly, fairly certain that in Courtney, every new, every new build has at least the hookup uh, available. So I, I guess uh, the only question I have is this something we really want to uh, spend staff time on? Um, and seeing that uh, we're going to be contemplating Courtney, it sounds like Comox, are you still looking at how to move forward on the whole whole deal? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, we haven't really even talked about it in council, but I imagine we're going to say the same thing that, uh, of course, we're interested, but, uh, you know, where do we get the money to do it and, and what's the implementation plan? Director Arbor? Yeah, so just from those couple of comments, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm glad I brought it up because I, you know, again, I'm naive to the issue, but if 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 two of our main, uh, you know, municipalities in town are looking at this, and if there's a potential for a regional approach or some kind of collaboration around grants or lobbying or things like that, it seems like I would definitely be in favor of staff spending a little bit of time. That's a good investment for the future. I recognize that the public hasn't always been on board around efforts like that because it can add costs. But at some point, um, I think everybody seems to be moving in that direction. So yeah, yeah and it might be of interest to br uh, to bring our report from Courtney to this committee right. for just out of interest to see where everything's at, and um, that could be one item that goes in that report. Thank Director you. Grieve. Yeah, just to echo what you uh, we, uh, the chair just said, I think uh, we can maybe dovetail in with Courtney's report. And uh, and then take it from there. I think uh, I think uh, Ms. Kirsten said a good thing when she says you know the atmosphere has changed in the Comox Valley a little bit in the past past few years. Uh, I would say that uh, that maybe uh, saying that water meters only last eight eight to ten years is is uh, probably not quite right. My understanding is they need about fifteen years and need to be recalibrated, but they're good for more than that. So I think things have come a long way. I would say that uh, it was mostly politically driven. Um, we did, we were saving up money for universal meter, metering at one time, and this board voted to give all that money back to uh, the city. I believe it was about two million dollars that, it, which by now we would have paid for probably. So uh, you know, it's just a matter of political will more than anything else. Okay, we have two more questions, and I think I'll get our CEO to weigh in on uh, how this report might look if this motion passes, Director Wells. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, you know, uh, get, given the fact that there is this interest, you know, one of the things that might be uh, potentially useful uh, as an add-on to, to this, uh, I don't know, necessarily needs to be an amendment or a friendly, but um, uh, just if there can be like a cursory look into what grants might be available, since since that seems to be one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, so not only kind of kind of seeing where things are, but again, just with the cursory conversation we've had here, if there's a, a point on there of just seeing are there grants that are available, whether it be gas tax or, or otherwise. I know that uh, there's a new green fund, uh, but uh, you know, after the $62.5 million, we, we may have used up a bit of our, our allotment, but um, uh, I, you know, again, I think uh, it was something that we had actually assumed uh, due to conversations would have been part of the water treatment project as is uh, um, uh, water meters being part of that but uh, that that would be my only comment I don't know if that has to be uh, written down or if that's good enough for staff I think it's good enough and I think it might be interesting to see how our communities might move forward together on the issue of water meeting, metering and so that's something that would be worthwhile at this table director Hamir right um, thank you and I'm wondering if um, we might open up the the scope just a tiny bit more um, to cover uh, co conservation, other conservation measures. Um, you know, the water meters for those who have uh, city water uh, are really effective. But um, you know, I understand. I remember staff 
uh, reporting about the bulk water carriers that we would be considering um, metering that um, or at least having some kind of card system because um, you know the rural areas are also going through a fair amount of city water um, already and it's um, and so what other measures are we looking at um, to help with conservation um, brown lawn initiatives I don't know if that's happening so it I think that would probably require a bigger amendment to your um, to your motion Daniel so I don't know if you would uh, be open to that or if you want to stick to just water meters and, and I'd caution that um you know, we don't want to load too much work on no. uh, to staff off the cuff, but um, I would even recommend that we just um, almost defer the motion and ask for the um, the Courtney report to come to this uh, table, and so we can open it up at that point and, and, and just talk about what Courtney is doing and what the other communities might want to do at the same time. I don't know if that's worthwhile. I'll pass it over to Director Arbor if, if you like. I was doing fine till that last comment. <laughs> you want to just keep no, expanding no, okay. it? No, well, that's okay. Well, let's do it all. It's valid. Uh, so uh, now I like Dr. Amir's comment, and, and actually that's a good question around the volumes to the rural area. So when um, Chris Rose was talking about the stage three, it's definitely having an impact on the rural areas where we're not in the water system. So I know this is outside of this water service, but as Dr. Amir talked about, there may be some demand from bulk water that, that impacts us. I don't know the scale of that, maybe it's minor. Uh, going back to the main issue, uh, yeah, I think I'd prefer to leave the conservation measure aside, but not losing them, like bringing them back to, in a different form. But for this one, maybe it, uh, it, it, I'd love to hear from Comox, perhaps, if there's, a, if there's any pressing thing that they'd want to get going on that from a regional perspective, or whether we'd be better to differ and, and wait to see midsummer what Courtney comes back with. I don't know if any Comox reps have a preference. Well, yeah, there's a mic here for Director Grant. Yeah. Well, I was just going to suggest that, actually, I think once we get into anything much further than this, um, this starts to look like something that might be an item for strategic planning later in the fall. Um, I'd be interested to see what the Courtney um, report has to say um, and take it from there. Uh, this, all, if it's a fairly high level history, uh, that's not very hard to get. Um, but if we start getting into more, I mean, we, we tend to, at the board and this board and, and the bigger board, bring a lot of issues over and above our strategic planning. And I think that it really puts a lot of stress on staff, and I think it's really hard for them to try and figure out what direction we're going. We have a strategic plan, and a lot of these issues, if it gets much bigger than a simple report, should probably be deferred to those. What? So, yeah. you I know, th this is a fairly simple one, but if we start adding to it, I think we're getting into that territory. Well, and I would still suggest that we defer this until we can get we can share Courtney's report, and then we can take it up, and, and maybe we take it to strategic planning. Maybe we just ask for that more in-depth report. I don't know if you're willing to wait on that, Director Arbor. Um, at, at, maybe just a minor add to Dr. Grant's. Um, I mean, we have a strategic plan, but I don't think we have a strategic plan for the Water Committee. Have we done one? I don't think we do. So we haven't done one, right? So uh, so I think I see that because it's on this committee, I, I don't see that as the critical issue. I would love a brief, because I'm sure we're probably with the staff we have, uh, even as we await Courtney, just a brief history, like a four or five sliders at our next meeting that shows his, here's a history of the attempts at bringing water metering in the regional district. So at least we're all on the same page when we receive the Courtney information. People like me will have more context. Around. Is that agreeable to the CEO? I was going to suggest that the directors have just provided both the history and current state of residential and commercial <laughs> water metering, and all there is to do is receive the report. But if you do want staff to follow up and put that in writing, we can do it for you. Deferred, but not forgotten. <laughs> all in favor of the, oh, is there a seconder for the deferral? Um, yeah, all in favor. Thanks, guys. And thanks, uh, Director Arbor, for bringing it up. I do appreciate it. And we'll move right into the, uh, I think it's adjournment or adjournment. termination. Adjournment. All in favor? Thanks. <laughs> Only a minute late. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks. That's right.